So, as you can see, uh, it's a joint paper with Martin Kocher here. So, uh, it's a kind of uh, review which we try and we also try to somewhat scan the more recent literature since 2000. But I, I, will, I will mainly focus on the beginning in, in this presentation here. And, okay, let me look a little, start by looking back. And actually, the whole enterprise was inspired by Uri Gnisi when uh, he said, okay, it, he had the same kind of argument, okay, it's 30 years ago, why don't you once again? And then I said, ah, oh, it's not really my strength to, <laughs> to read all the literature. <laughs> I rather prefer to write myself and make you read. <laughs> so, but how did it begin? Uh, be, uh, how was it at the beginning? There was an established literature. Uh, I mainly focus on the strategic approach to bargaining. There was a literature, there was a, a dynamic concession bargaining model by Zeuthen. And of course, there was this uh, axiomatic and constructive uh, game approach, uh, the non strategic approach by Nash. And that the two were very closely related was already shown by, uh, by John Azani. So that was known. What I'm not really sure about is, it's, it's really some time ago, whether I, at that time I was aware of the tradition in social psychology of the, what they called reward allocation experiments. Actually, these were the first and much better dictator experiments than ever run by uh, experimental economists because they made them first work together and then allow them in a dictatorial way to allocate the rewards. And of course, these data of reward allocation experiments were data really according, uh, without the data had really no noise structure at all. In a sense, the way it was run is Max and I worked together and you would tell me, Werner, you did 40% of the work, Max did 60% of the work, and I then was led into a room where our joint money, joint earnings were lying on the table, and the experimenter would say to me, I now leave the room, you leave, you take as much money as you want, and you leave through the other door, so you won't see me again, and then they finally looked up how much money I left. Of course, they were cheating quite often because there was no, uh, there was no Max. Uh, so in a sense, but these data were nearly without noise because I did it just according to equity theory. I just took my fair share and I left what was due to, to Max. So in a sense, I, but I wasn't sure about this and that's why I also point to this kind of study. This was uh, somewhat, at least at that time, when I wrote this study, I ran this experiment in 81 and 82. It was uh, an experiment on dictatorial labor allocation. Actually, what was the task? There were 12 compli complicated tables of uh, multiplication tasks. Without a calculator, you needed two hours to solve them all. And the way we did, I did it was, okay, both the allocator and the, other, the more passive partner got 10 marks uh, as a reward but the dictator could say how many of the 12 tables he, he, he does and how many the other does. We made it interesting, uh, I made it interesting by giving the allocator a, a, a pocket calculator. So with a pocket calculator, it, it took you 15 minutes to do it, and as I said, without a calculator, I did this. So I did this kind of study, it, it's a dictator experiment, but it's not a reward allocation, it's labor allocation, and the data were very nice. They were, 63 allocated participants, five of them were completely selfish. They made these other people, their partners suffer. They had to sit there for two hours doing this uh, boring type of thing, but nobody left. And, but most of them were really allocating the, the 12 tables in such a way that the expected working time was the same. So in a sense, uh, very nicely, 10 or 11 or 12, they did. There was nobody who really did six to six. 
this, this primitive standard, no? neglecting that the allocator has a calculator and for him it's much easier. So this, why do I talk a little bit about this study here? Because my, I ran this study because I was invited to, to join a committee of the German Economic Association, the Sozialwissenschaftliche Ausschuss, and at that time they still published yearly proceedings. So all the presentations were published in a proceedings volume. And unfortunately at that year it was, the theme was egoism and altruism. So when I, okay, I was invited, it was an honor to be invited, so I felt proud and, and of course I took the title seriously. So I did some game theoretic exercises with privately known and commonly known altruism and I was completely frustrated. Because what happened is, of course, I, I, I knew all the literature about pro-social behavior, but if I explain it by altruism, it's just what I put in, I get out. Rather than asking why are people pro-social, uh, no, I say, okay, because they have pro-social motives. And that somewhat explains why I was a bit allergic to social preference ideas. Now, ever since that time, and I was very happy that I had this additional uh, dictatorial labor allocation task because I, I got really so upset about this and I said, you don't really explain something, you just retransform one question into another one. That was my. The other thing is that I was always before already playing around with the idea of ultimatum bargaining as a special negotiation model. Actually, I can prove that. It's an even. That's my first paper written in English, and it was a mess. I, I kept revising the paper forever because, and it got cycling. No? So, in a sense, because uh, my all my career work, my dissertation thesis, my habilitation thesis, these former books you had to write, and everything else I did before was written in Germany, and I was haggling with this. But as you can see, it has already this kind of thing. But at that time, this was written in, when I was in Berkeley in 75, I still wanted to become a game theorist. Huh? So that was my intention. So, Okay, how did it go on then? Okay, exactly 35 years ago, I became a professor here in Cologne. Huh? So it's really 35 years ago. And actually, in that, during that time, uh, I was collaborating with Reinhard Selten, mainly on, equi on equilibrium selection theory. And since we were close together, there were always these workshops we had where experimentalists, both from economics and psychology, and game theorists met. We usually had that meetings, sometimes once, sometimes twice a year, mostly in Bielefeld. And there was one of the, in my first months, so I just became this new professor, and then I went to one of those meetings, it was in the Alpine region, was organized by Wolf Algers and Günther Bamberg, from, they were at that time at the University of Augsburg. When I came back, they gave me 1,000 mark to run experiments. So that's seduction. Huh? That you, you don't plan anything, people just do it on you. Huh? So it's, it just happened to me. And it, it was, they really had that money to make game theorists run experiments. That's unethical, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but they were successful, so in a sense. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether they still remember. I remained once, uh, Wolf and uh, Günther Bamberg. So, uh, what was the consequence? Of course, I was playing around with the ultimatum bargaining idea already, and I said, I don't want to have this characteristic function experiments where everything is confounded. I just want the, let me start bargaining experimentation with the simplest idea, and that was ultimatum bargaining. And in addition with that, so 1,000 mark, the pilot was cheap, but the main study was, I think the pie size varied from four to 10 German marks. Uh, uh, we ran this ultimatum games, simple and complicated ones. I will talk about the complicated ones a little bit in a minute. And we ran a second prize auction. So that's what I said. 
And actually, and those were my two student helpers, and actually we did it next door. There was one lecture room which had a movable door, so we had a proposal room, a responder room, one always watching them so that they guaranteeing independence and one person walking in between the two rooms, because at that time it was not computerized for sure. Uh, and that's the way. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, we combined the two ideas by saying, trying to guarantee entitlement by auctioning the roads. And this is, uh, I was a journalist just recently wrote to me and said, what was the most surprising result in all your experimental work? And I said, it was related to this, because when I ran this auctioning the roles of ultimate bargaining, you take your cash box with you. It was also a pen and paper experiment. But I always came back with more money than I took there. Because what we used was, uh, of course, the second price auction. And what do you get? It's a strategic auction. You get the most ambitious guy for, all, for both roles. And they very often do not agree. And I still remember one guy. I had to collect 55 marks from the student participant. And he was nearly crying. But I, of course, I, <laughs> I had to keep up my reputation. So if you ever run out of money, auction the roles. Uh, you don't need support. Now, if the German Science Foundation says, OK, we don't have any more money from heaven tradition in economics. But of course, later on, I had then more money. <laughs> and we ran more experiments. And of course, it was unbelievable if you work for Max Planck. You can do whatever you want. It's, it's just the most wonderful position in the world. And you have many friends, if you are Max Planck. <laughs> so uh, let me somewhat review the, the whole idea. Uh, OK, I, I, I do it in a little bit formal way so that you can see how the game changed. So there is always a pie size. Once I was asked, in former times, uh, actually, that was my bad English. We said cake distribution. And it was El Roth who corrected me. He said, it's pie, not cake. <laughs> cake in German would be tort, but of tile. So uh, there are two roles. Usually I refer to the X as a proposer, Y is a responder. And the sequence is very simple. First, there is this given pie size. I just allow for only for intermediate offers. So first, the proposer chooses how much he offers to the responder. And learning about the offer, the responder can say yes, delta of epsilon equal to 1, or no, delta of epsilon equal to 0. And then it's a very nice way to describe the payoffs. So what it means is if, if the responder accepts, it's distributed as suggested. Otherwise, both get nothing. Especially for the sake of uh, um, Bob Aumann, who always said, I'm not surprised about the 50-50 result in, in this game has lots of equilibria. It has a solution, a unique solution, which is always accept and give the amount to the responder according to one's repeated elimination of the weakly dominated strategies. But it has lots of equilibria. Especially, so in a sense, it's an equilibrium if the proposer offers Y, and the responder would accept this Y on anything above, but he would reject anything below. That's an equilibrium. But of course, it's in weakly dominated strategy. So it has lots of equilibrium. And some people say, as long as it is an equilibrium outcome, it doesn't trouble me. So especially the 50-50 outcome is an equilibrium outcome. But of course, uh, we have lots of evidence because they say no to substantial offers. That's a really surprising non-equilibrium form. So it was always this way that the response behavior is, a, is what needs an explanation. Uh, uh, what proposal behavior, having such response behavior, is rather well adjusted to that. So in a sense, the task was always how to explain this. And then it always was clear that this is essentially a punishment game. The ultimate in this is. OK. 
Now, let me, this early paper had two chapters, and nobody ever talks about the second one. So, in a sense, it, it's funny. So, what was this, the second, uh, the, the so called, what we call complex or complicated games? Uh, what we had, this should be two stacks, two stacks of 10 chips, black and white, and the chips had different values for the two persons. So what this, in a sense, introduces, I don't want to say much about it. It has moderate exploitation here, only moderate, ex the way we parameterized it, parameterized it. But what it also has, it adds an efficiency aspect. In the ultimate game, the only efficiency aspect is if he rejects, the money is lost. Here, you also can distribute uh, more or less money depending on how you allocate the two, pair, two, two colors of chips. So that is, and the other thing which I want to propagate is it's a multi-dimensional offer. So he, you decide how many, uh, you choose M and N. And sometimes I wonder whether too many social dilemma situations are just uh, based on one-dimensional decision variables. And because you want to infer all the motives from a one-dimensional decision, if you go to a dilemma situation which has multi-dimensional action space, it might be easier to infer motives from behavior. That's uh, something that might have been the idea, but it's a long time ago. But nobody talks about this. OK, I come now to some variations which we did rather lately. And I'm also wondering why didn't we do them earlier? Because I also got a little bit afraid that uh, when I do other variants of ultimatum arrangements, people would say, OK, he always does the same kind of thing. Now, he, he once had a success, and now it's like sequels. He, he can just repeat himself. So, so I was a bit reluctant. And with the yes, no game, I think, I still remember you were still in Jena. And that, I can, should we run this? Now, I wasn't completely sure. This is the yes, no game. So the yes, no game is quite simple variation of the ultimatum game. All what changes is when the responder decides about whether to accept the offer or not, he doesn't know the offer. Huh? It's like marrying a covered lady. You don't know what you get. And we call it, uh, uh, why is buying a pig in a poke? In German, it's die Katze im Sackhaus. Jordi will appreciate it. So, uh, the, what you have to see is, of course, this reduces greatly the strategy set of the responder. There are only two strategies. Because you don't know the offer, yes or no. No? You have something in an opaque envelope, you don't know what it contains, and you have to say yes or no. Marry an unknown bride or so. No? That's a... Okay. Uh, but of course, since if all offers have to be positive, you should always, uh, if you are opportunistic, always say yes. You should always accept the offer. But then, of course, uh, you the proposal will just give you the minimal offer. So the difference from the ultimatum game is now we have a unique equilibrium. Again, you can derive it by once, elim uh, repeated elimination of weakly dominant strategies, but it's a unique equilibrium here. And actually, in the lab study, we always had acceptance. And, uh, but this changed in, with Oliver Kirchkam, a colleague in my colleague at the University of Jena. We did it in a newspaper study, and there we had some people rejecting. But we changed it also because we had two pie sizes there. So only for the small size, we had two pie sizes. One was 1,000 euro, one was 100 euro. For 100 euro, they, there were some rejections. Once in a while, we have to tell them, the, the ex guys, not to be too greedy or something. And the offers were smaller than in the ultimate game in the lab study and larger than in the dictator game. So some of the stylized facts here, the offers are usually 40% on average. Here you get the one quarter in the yes, no game, whereas in the dictator game, some rough figure would be that you get 15%. And if you take the response, 
be mostly here have uh, you have rather frequent rejections if you give ver very little, smaller than one third of the pi. Here we had hardly any rejection, at least in the lab study. And here I have a problem with most dictated experiments because I think they are run mostly in the wrong way. Because compared to the ultimatum game, you take too many things away. You, you don't take veto power away, punishment power. For punish, taking punishment power away would be simply the veto only questions the, the X payoff of the uh, proposal. That would be already punishment power. And actually in punity games, we only have that. Uh, but we also don't take that away, the veto power, the punishment power, and we also take the voice away. Why don't we allow in the dictator game still the uh, responder to make a choice and give feedback of that choice to the proposer? You make him, you don't only take punishment power and, and refusal power away, but you also take the voice away. And I think that's uh, some problem, but I'm guilty of that too. No? We often run it in the simple way, but why not eliciting a, a, a response nevertheless? And, and at least I think the responder should be able to say no to the little he gets. As the, or as the recipient should be. So in a sense, I, I think that there I have a problem with most of that. Okay, we also did, actually there was one presentation in this conference. I think the claim was wrong. We had a one in a random stranger design. We had a, a, an experiment with 100 rounds of rep, rep, repetitive ultimatum game. And somebody said, okay, it, if you repeat the ultimatum game, it converges to the solution. Propose, uh, offers get lower and responders more often say yes. Somebody claimed that. And it's completely wrong. In this one hundred, after three to four rounds, we ran this with a monotonic uh, strategy method for responders, so they gave you an acceptance threshold. After three to four periods, every, each and every responder asked for 50, and it was granted. Became very boring. After three to four periods, they were all at the 50-50. Responders demanding 50-50, proposals offering 50-50. And we just, that's 14, two weeks ago, with uh, Hiro Otsubo, we ran an, one for the uh, yes-no game. There we had some convergence down. But here we also wanted to have it slightly uh, more complicated. We gave them either a high, a large, or a small pie allowing proposers with large pies to hide behind the fear split of the small pie. And actually, that is a tendency we observed in early experiments. So you want to appear fair. No? It's not that you are really truly fair, but you want to appear as fair. And if, if you can hide behind the small pie, OK. I, worse, I gave you 50 of the small pie. No? He cannot be sure for that. And actually, like in the, and then also us can say yes, because uh, we, in this yes-no game, like in the yes-no game, we gave two morals for this, two reasons for this. One is in dubio pro, me, pro, pro reo, because us wouldn't know whether I really had the big pie. It was very likely that I had it. But, and the other is in dubio pro meo. Uh, okay. Why, why reject a little? I still, it could have been fair. Huh? So in a sense, uh, these principles uh, justify this. So we did this learning study, and we, there we really see that the structure of the equilibrium set has some influence on the, dynam on the learning dynamics. <laughs> OK, we come now to another more recent variation. These are what we call generosity game experiments. And I did them mainly with my Italian friends on my friends from uh, Tübingen. So uh, what changes here is that the proposer, when he chooses, he doesn't allocate a given pie size, but he chooses the pie. How much can be distributed? No? So uh, the choice is choice of the pie size. So there is a general interval. He can choose any kind of pie size from uh, above not below P lower bar and not above P upper bar. 
where there are some restrictions. Here what is introduced, how is this chosen pi distributed? There is an exogenously, by the experimenter, exogenously imposed agreement payoff for, for the proposer. What he gets, whatever he chooses, if it's accepted, he cannot be self-serving. He cannot help himself. So the responder is the residual claimant, as you see it from the payoff function. So if he says yes, he gets his exogenously imposed uh, agreement payment. That was, was, is what we determine as experimenters. And by his pi choice, he determines the residual for the responder. <coughs> so the Y learns about P and has to say yes or no, as in the ultimatum game. So there is, actually, there is no trade-off here. You can, you, they, they, he can be generous to the responder without having to pay for that. So in a sense, that's the kind of situation we wanted to study. And of course, this, this what are the sum, uh, parameters here? This guarantees, this inequality guarantees that there is always, even for all pie choices, there is some positive amount left. So the responder should always say yes. And these other inequalities guarantee that the equal split is an interior solution. So if you are really equality seeking, you should go choose a pi size p equal to 2x. However, if you are efficiency concerned, you should go to the maximum pi. And of course, we initially expected a lot of uh, 2x choices. So. <coughs> And actually, there were two modes. Uh, let's say here, the findings is that we usually had acceptance, and uh, ex except when you really have chosen the very low pi below two x or something like that, then there was some some rejection. But uh, again, there is very little noise in the data because there are two modes. One is two x, and one is maximal pi size. However, the maximum pi size dominates. This is about uh, two-thirds, this is about one-third. So most of our proposals were really more efficiency-minded than equality-seeking. I should want to. Okay, uh, once you did that, you say, okay, uh, can't the other, can the other role be the residual claimant? And then that yields the so-called envy game. And we had yesterday two presentations on envy games. What, what changed is here is that now the proposer himself became the residual claimant. And now choosing a large pie is very self-serving. No? It's very self-serving. And especially if you choose a pie size which is above the one yielding an equal split. Oh, you are self -serving. He wants to get a lot. No? And, and uh, that's why this could uh, arouse envy feel feelings, arouse envy feelings, and that's why we call it the envy game. So the rule should be clear now. Uh, if, if he says that, he gets the residual. And of course, now the agreement payoff of the responder is exogenously given. And we have, again, a similar solution. And of course, the solution should now should say you want to choose a maximal pi. So there is a unique uh, solution. But there are multiple equilibria, as usually, because you have these unreached information sets in these extensive games. And yeah, the results compared to the generosity game, I mentioned it already, you have uh, uh, two modes. Uh, uh, e equality and efficiency, uh, but this is more frequent. Uh, we also ran, actually that was in, run in Tübingen, uh, the thing with auctioning the roles. But this time we didn't use a strategic auction, but we used the uh, random price mechanism. Huh? Some people say, what do they say? Uh, BDM or something. I call it the random price mechanism. Or so. Uh, so, and then you get a bit more noise, but the modes are, are not questioned. And if you compare this to the uh, Envy game, uh, Matteo gave a very nice presentation yesterday, I can be very short, 
there were some uh, rejections for, for pi choices which were uh, exceeding the equality to, to y choice. And, uh, however, this was not very pr uh, prohibitive because most people still, uh, many people still chose the maximum pi. But let me just mention it. So, uh, you should have gone to Matteo's talk. And, and uh, so then another variant we did one very early on was, okay, adding more people to the ultimatum game. And, and uh, there are lots of other studies, competition of proposers, competition of responders, random proposers, random responders. I don't cover that all, but uh, I just want to go to the so-called three-person games. And the first study was a joint paper. Actually, that experiment was still pen and paper, was the most difficult pen and paper study I ever did is at the University of Tilburg at Center. And we invited participants for the evening, and it was, I, when we left, we had so much material. No? So the next day, we were shuffling through decision forms. So what happens here, we are back to the constant pi scenario, but there is a third person. We call him a dummy. So we don't, X is still the proposer, he's a responder, and we have the new player, and we call him a dummy. No? He, he doesn't really have much to decide, but he can entertain lots of hopes. No? Uh, and actually, uh, Nikos yesterday referred to that paper. No? So, and I said, so what he does, there is a given pi size, and he distributes it among the three players, x, y, and z. And uh, what Nikos referred to is, uh, did anybody care for this helpless dummy? Uh, in the main standard condition, the main standard condition was when the responder learned about the whole vector, x, y, and z. The, in this standard condition, he hardly got, I think he never got anything, uh, at, at least one third of the pi. He was always treated unfairly. And did at least the responder care for the dummy? No. There was no single rejection where we could say, oh, this is because the dummy got so little. Whenever a responder said no, he got little. Maybe the dummy also got little, but he got, uh, already by his own assignment, he was in, uh, it induced to say no. So this was very decisive, and I think uh, Gary Bolton and uh, Axel have written a paper. They were inspired by this because, in a sense, what we learn from this is you, uh, your inequality aversion is more defensive. You want to defend yourself rather than somebody else because here they didn't care. However, with Carsten Schmidt uh, and uh, Matthias Sutter, we also ran a newspaper study. There was a little bit more of fairness. But, and uh, essentially, the interesting thing in these newspaper things is, of course, you don't have to go to funny countries to find funny behaviors. Take an old German lady, the oldest German lady we had in our newspaper was above 90. She was very nice. And, uh, and compared to young male students, this is a lot of a difference. And the, the other interesting thing from the newspaper experiment is that the medium of participating in the experiment was very decisive. If somebody uses the snail mail, fax or sending, cutting out the newspaper thing and sending it by mail. He is very fair, usually. But the sharks on the internet who use the internet participation, well, they are very bad. So be aware, don't touch computers. That's. <laughs> but the general finding here is, of course, that you have something like a power collision. There was a dummy. And there is a proposer and the responder. They both have strategic influence, and of course, they mainly share this. So the, what you really see here is a kind of power collision. We did this also. That was what Agnes Baker yesterday presented. So in a sense, I can be, again, very short. Uh, so you should have gone to Agnes. Uh, that's, we also ran a three word uh, uh, of this. Uh, Generosity game and of the envy game. Let me see. The interesting thing here is, of course, if you have three persons, you have three persons to receive payoffs. 
One is a residual claimant, but the others can have experimentally induced agreement payoffs. So we had, in the generosity version, we had two variants. He had always, the proposer always, and that's why we speak of the generosity game, he could not be self-serving. He had always his exogenously e e induced agreement payoff, X. But the residual claimant here is this dummy, and here it is the responder. So these games can differ very much. And the equilibria, let me not talk too much about it. Uh, it's pretty much the same as in the other, uh, in the original uh, generosity game. The chance which gave this to us is, of course, since you have two exogenously induced agreement plans, you can make them equal or you can make them unequal. And what we notice from the data is this has very, very strong demand effects, questioning the stability of if you ever have hoped to find some robust social preferences, this question is. If general equality is possible because the two exogenous agreement payoffs agree, then they usually go to general equal equality. And efficiency seeking becomes very weak. However, if you are in the treatment where they already, two of at least, have to have different, exposed two different payoffs, then of course you go to the old mode of efficiency seeking. I think I said that. So, and of course, logically, we also did it for the NV game. In the NV game, as I said, uh, the residual claimant is, by definition, the proposer, and the two agreement payoffs are here, and then, okay, you can do the same, and you can, uh, here you see the treatments, you can have them rather unequal, here or here, or have them equal. And what you see is that the responder usually says no, no if you deviate in your own favor as a proposer from, from e general equality, because here it's possible, 18 would guarantee a general equality. If you choose a pie size of 18, the responder gets six, the dummy gets six, then 18 minus 12 would give you also six. If you demand more, it gets dangerous. And of course, uh, the responder is also very angry if he's the unfavored one getting only three. So in a sense, uh, that happens. And uh, you also see that usually you have uh, this, uh, the efficiency seeking as the only mode here and here, whereas here you, it really becomes bimodal. All of a sudden, equity seeking becomes strong if general equ equality is possible. Uh, and we also ran as a control the uh, dictator experiments and sometimes in these generosity games uh, whether the responder has veto power or not doesn't really make a bit, lot of a difference. But uh, a much more detailed presentation was given by uh, Agnes Baker. Uh, what we also try to do a little bit is uh, the funny thing is if you, if you come, uh, it's partly a review, partly a survey and so whether we want to finally, we are of course eager to publish something. Uh, we are still very ambitious. We are young and ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we also try a little bit to review the literature, what Ed does is, is recently and uh, Let's just go a little bit uh, through that survey. I also should mention in the paper, the paper is, sh should be ready soon, we cover much more material. We, uh, especially material where we say, where we frame the ultimate, the very special game in a huger class of games. We did many of those exercises. The advantage of those exercises is that sometimes you can use the same verbal instructions and you just change numerical parameters to explore different treatments. It's one thing which I propagate. If possible, just run numeric, uh, different treatments by distinguishing par different parameter sets. So you always have the same verbal instructions, but some numbers just differ. 
If that is possible, I, I, it's something you should rather do because the implicit and explicit demand effects of verbal instructions can be dramatic, especially for first round behavior. So uh, there is more literature on fairness, perception, and emotions, increase or reduce asymmetry in further. As I said, uh, for instance, a study by Grimm and Mangel on cooling off uh, was quite uh, telling, and of course, emotions is a big thing. Uh, there could be social comparisons depending on which feedback you provide. Do you only learn about your own play? Do you get population feedback? We were always interested, can we run something in the lab similar to, to evolution? And one would be that you say, okay, I get population feedback or so. Uh, of course, there is this socio-demographic and individual determinants of play and culture. I never traveled to other countries to learn about, as I said, then I, I could go to a German senior citizen home and I would be already very different from student participants. So in a sense, I, I was not a fan. There was a lot of, uh, is still a lot of uh, study on varying stake size. As I said, I admit this, uh, in our initial study, you had only 1,000 mark. We varied the pie size from four to 10. Uh, in the newspaper experiments, we went up to 1,200 euro, but of course only for a random uh, selection of uh, participants. And of course, uh, what I still think is, what we are all, most experimentalists are guilty of is, we usually run mana from heaven experiments. And that bias for sure our results very much. When we auctioned the positions of ultimatum bargainers, we had I think maybe one equal split, maybe one. But of course, it changes behavior dramatically. The whole mode of equality disappears completely. So in a sense, we should be careful uh, concluding too much from mana from heaven distribution experiments. Because if you had to work, so my old idea was to hire a lot of student uh, helpers and make them work for a year. And after the year, uh, uh, say, okay, the two of you on that together. Now Amrai is uh, making an ultimatum offer to, to Martin and, and he can say yes or no. And then it would be really a big amount of money. And then people say, okay, if, because there was always this intuition, if the stake, if the pie size becomes very large, would I say no to 10,000 euro? And of course, if I worked for it for three years, huh? I would say no. I work for it, and then he wants to give me, he, he gets, say, half a million, and I should just uh, live with 10,000 euro. It will be such a lot of fun to say, okay, you don't get the half of the million, I don't get the 10,000. So in a sense, you also, these entitlements, I think, if, if they do this, they should do it together. Not just vary the, the stake size as mana from heaven, but then make them really work for it. And then you will see that the, the results are rather robust. <coughs> what else? Of course, the ultimatum game was a favorite uh, uh, workhorse to, to discuss this uh, hot versus cold strategy method, strategy vector method, as in newspaper experiment versus uh, uh, hot play. And I think uh, recently I, in a paper with uh, Sven, we were haggling with a reviewer a little bit because uh, in our view, at least, the, the evidence so far is inconclusive. Very often, we don't see lots of uh, differences, but of course, some get a lot of difference. But I think, that, uh, to say something fair, the evidence is rather inconclusive. But that, I've really simply argued, okay, if you use a strategy method, okay, you change the results dramatically. Then. Sven got very angry about this. You see, in old age, you see it. <laughs> so then, uh, pre period communication and messages, this is where all your lying is about. Now, in a sense, uh, if you, for instance, have an ultimatum game where the pie can be large or small, and then you can, uh, I can send a message to Max and, and say, okay, oh, Max, unfortunately, the pie is small. I, I give you only so little or so. And, and that can be studied. And if you do that, in a sense, you can, of course, also study that a little bit by without messages. 
not without explicit lying because we observed the hiding behind the small pie already afterwards. And actually, responders were very suspicious, but at, as I said, they have an excuse because they say in dubio pro reo or in dubio pro meo. No? It's, self, it's either they have a self serving excuse or this justice principle. Of course, we have all this kind. Actually, I also was in the scanner uh, as a responder, and they cheated on me uh, uh, successfully because I, a week before that, I was uh, report, uh, asked to take comment on a, on a, a, a research application where they wanted to uh, get the finances for parallel scanning. And I was convinced, of course, that the psychologists in Jena have that already because it's a very, very strong faculty in, in psychology. So I thought, and, and they, may, so I had all these buttons already around my head and was started already hurting. And they said, oh, we have to wait another five minutes because the other person is not ready. So they, I believed them. And I said, so, uh, fortunately, the, the the data showed that I have a little bit of brain. So in a sense, there was some light. But of course, what you also learn is the main reasoning you do when you read the instructions. And when you read the instructions, uh, there is no, uh, no scanning yet done. So uh, I, it, it, for me, it just became a priming experiment on numerical priming. Because I said, OK, everything above you will accept. Everything below you will reject. So it simply became a priming study, whether it was above or below. I had a little bit of brain, so I understand. <laughs> and of course, uh, there are evolutionary studies using the ultimatum. Uh, uh, York did a study. There has been more. Did a study. Been more similar, and so on. In that sense, uh, an indirect evolution could also do something. Uh, let me somewhat conclude a little bit also on a more conceptual level. Uh, it was once mentioned that I always propagating, arguing against game fitting exercises and so-called neoclassical repairs. That was in a sense, in a sense because uh, as I mentioned it already, it was this lecture which I got from this 84 paper where I said, okay, I don't really explain much. I, what I essentially do, I transform the question, why such behavior and why such motivation? And uh, that also, in a sense, inspired me to do indirect evolution because it, it allowed you to give a better reason. You were more disciplined in speculating about uh, other regarding concerns, for instance. So, but... What I propagate, so is a version, a version. So I am not completely against the version. A version, a version is very nice. So. Uh, uh, but more basically, I think what we need is really a dynamic. We need a behavioral complement of rational choice theory. We need a dynamic theory of decision making. Decision making is a dynamic process. Where well, you start by so all these static ways of it also applies to prospect theory. I'm also not a fan of prospect theory. It's only bad utility theory in a sense. So in a sense, I'm not really so. These kind of static approaches, uh, it's just my cup of tea. But of course, I also view orthodox game theory. I never viewed really as a behavioral theory. It, it's it's a wonderful philosophical exercise. And it's beautiful, it's elegant, and we can be proud of it, but it, it, of course it cannot explain well. Especially all the common knowledge assumptions of, of uh, orthodox game theory are ridiculous in a sense. If you allow for idiosyncratic preferences, how can they ever be common knowledge? So in a sense, I'm... Now I said this, okay? So, uh, so this is on game fitting. If once one, one form of game fitting exercise organizes a lot of data, it, it's, I, I don't deny this learn tells us a lot. So in a sense, it's not that uh, I say, OK, refuse this literature. There will be this literature. I, I also, as a referee, I would accept it. And if they, the same kind of, say, fitting exercise, fitting idea, it accounts for lots of empirical findings. We all learn a lot. But of course, what I think is, 
it's only an as if explanation. And actually, that's also how Klaus Schmidt always defended uh, inequality version. You may too. And you can speak afterwards. Uh, uh, but it's only an as if, ex an ex if explanations don't provide a basis for giving individual advice. For instance, if you do consulting, like maybe in, in Max explained it in a sense, you cannot say, there is a, say, she is a very rich lady, she runs the firm, and, and Max would go there, and the first question was, give me your social preferences. I think she could slam the door in your face or something. That, that's I am imagining. No? Or a, I cannot go to somebody and say, give me your utility of money curve or something like that. No? I, I have to ask them questions in categories which they process themselves. So that is why I say understanding how we generate choices really requires process models of cognition to, uh, information processing and making up your mind. It's a dynamic process, even if it's isolated decision making. So since 2000, uh, the ultimate game is still a useful workhorse for quite a variety of uh, uh, research questions. I don't say that every study which uses the ultimate game is really trying, it, it may just use it as a workhorse. Actually, in principal agent theory, it was usually the take it or leave it off all right. This is an empty, and I said, I, I just wanted to make one remark. Uh, <coughs> as you have heard, uh, it's exactly 35 years ago that I, for the first time, we became a professor and that I started here. It, exactly 35 years. It, I stayed 10 years in Cologne, and I think they were very, very influential for me. Because uh, I was an associate professor here. In the first half, I was never invited to join any meetings. <laughs> so, uh, so it was really a scholarship with teaching load. And it, it had a dramatic, I think, a dramatic impact on me. There was little money, so we never, our family never went on vacation. So we usually don't go on vacation because I went to workshops and somehow. <laughs> And um, the other thing is I became, I guess, totally focused on teaching and research. Everything else what interests professors wasn't my cup of tea. So in a sense, I, I, I became a bit, and I have never been a dean. So in a sense, and it would have been a drama no? if I would have become a, so because of this, because I was totally focused. For 10 years, all I cared for, the real students were my uh, students. We worked at actually one of the early participants of the ultimatum experiments was Tilman Burgers, who is now a professor in the United States. So, in a sense, so some people come back. What I'm really thinking a little bit about is okay, now I'm, the hair is gray. <laughs> so, uh, how many years can I still go? And so, and, and, and I'm wondering, and, and maybe another 30 years or so, 35 or so. Uh, okay. Let's wait and see. Thank you.